food nowadays, there's going to be the same thing coming in music. And it's not going to be the major labels that are going to do it, because they don't understand this change. They don't understand this change. This is going to come from smaller labels, from people of commitment, because people still need music. People hunger for music. Music changes people's lives. I'm going to talk about that later today in my Love Songs lecture. Music changes people's lives. And when you have too many people in the music industry who do not believe, that's what creates the crisis. And fixing that is what's going to solve the crisis. Now there's one more, th I'm going to let you ask questions in a minute, but there's one more thing I want to say. Like I say, some of you probably think what I'm saying is just common sense. Others of you are probably outraged. Probably from the moment I criticized One Direction. That probably lost you at that point. But there's probably some of you are outraged. Some of you probably are just saying, this is what, I, you know, this is just common sense. But I want to talk about one thing that people push back on me. They say, Ted, you talk about art and you talk about entertainment, but aren't they really the same thing? I mean, one person likes Justin Bieber, someone else likes Mozart. Who are you to say that one is better than the other? Who are you to say that one is art and the other is entertainment? So let's ask ourselves this question. This is a very important question. Is there really no difference between art and entertainment? Are they really pretty much the same thing? I don't think so. And let me just let's start by looking at what is entertainment? What is the job of the entertainer? The job of the entertainer is to find out what the audience wants and gives them exactly that. That's what an entertainer does. I find out what the audience wants, and I give them exactly that. For example, the, the biggest thing in motion pictures next year is going to be the new Star Wars movie. What is the value proposition? What's the selling pitch for it? I'll tell you what it is. Here's the selling pitch for the movie. You remember those six other Star Wars films you saw? We're going to give you another one that's exactly like it. It's going to have the same characters, the same actors. They're a little older, but what you saw, we're going to give you the same thing again. You know all those Spider-Man movies you saw? The next one is going to be exactly like that. This is what entertainment is, is it not? You find out what the audience wants, and you give it to them over and over again. But art doesn't work like that. Art does not work like that. When you deal with the work of art, you must adjust to the work of art. Try reading Herman Melville's Moby Dick. He's not going to give you exactly what you want. You must adapt to what he's giving you. You want to wrestle with those Michelangelo paintings in the Sistine Chapel? You've got to broaden your mind. Michelangelo is not going to give you what you're expecting. That's the nature of art. Art challenges you. Art forces you to go where it is. Art forces you out of your comfort zone. Art forces you to mature as a person and to consider things you haven't considered before. Isn't that true? Anyone who tried to read James Joyce's Ulysses? Anyone ever read a really difficult book and afterwards you say, boy, I had to wrestle with that. But I'm more of a person now because I did that. So there couldn't be anything more different than entertainment and art. You couldn't possibly have any two things more different than entertainment and art. And then let me ask you this question. Which of those experiences more is more valuable? I'm going to give you exactly what you saw before again, or I'm going to challenge you, I'm going to broaden you, I'm going to force you to mature, I'm going to get you to think of things you've never thought of before. You know the answer to that. The artistic experience is much more important than the entertainment experience. And the people who have that artistic experience are intensely loyal to it. Because you can go back to a great work of art again and again. And that's why the entertainment industry now complains that there's some musical acts. The first album sells, but the second one doesn't. And they, they say, we don't have any staying power with these bands. But if you look at the really artistic artists, I know, whether it's Bob Dylan or the Beatles or, or Bach or whatever, the really sophisticated artistic experience maintains loyalty over a period of decades. So I, let me, I'm going to give you a chance to ask questions, but just let me sum up and say, what you find is when you look at the other crises, it always comes back to the artistic one. 
When we looked at economics, we found that HBO could make money by making it sophisticated with artistic talent. When we looked at technology, we found that the technology crisis was not that technology is bad, but these, these dumbing down technologies are bad. So no, you can't escape it. The fundamental crisis in music is an aesthetic and cultural one, and it is in our power to change that. We can change that. And I said before I'm controversial, and it probably is controversial to say stand up for art, because we live in a world dominated by these entertainment companies, and they have lots of money. And the media wants entertainment, and there's, there's not much space for art anymore. But each of us needs to nurture that. We need to be advocates for it. We need to stand up for it. And if that means being controversial, we should all be a little controversial, huh? We should all be a little bit controversial. So let me say, there is a crisis in music, but it is a solvable one. And there are people out there that have already solved it and showed that content does not want to be free, that people will pay for the right kind of artistic experience. So I embrace this aesthetic view of our destiny. I urge you to do so, too. So I urge you, be outrageous, be controversial yourselves, and be artistic. Thank you very much. I'll now answer any questions you have. Great talk. Um, so there's an interesting argument that I've read by an artist named Amanda Palmer. You've maybe read it. She did a TED talk one time um, on called The Art of Asking. Um, and she's a performer. She's a musician. And she said that um, she produces most of her music and everything. She'll produce it and give it away for free and ask the fans to pay what they want for it. Um, do you think that's like a logical, sustainable um, way of making music where uh, the fans will pay what they desire if it moves. She says that if something moves them to a point, they'll pay for it as much as they feel. Um, or if they'll give a dollar for it, then that's what she'll make from them. But uh, that's how she's given away most of her music at this point. Just wondering your yeah. thoughts on that. It's an unconventional way of, of, of structuring the finances of a recording. But I don't, I don't disagree with what she's doing. You know, the internet's a terrible thing in many ways, but the most powerful thing the internet has done is it's allowed creative people to have direct contact with their audience. You know, I've been writing books for more than 30 years. And my first book came out, I actually used a typewriter. I mean, that's how old I am. I've actually written a book on a typewriter. This was before there were computers. And in those days, I had to get a publisher. The publisher would print the book. The book would go to a book distributor, it would go to a bookstore, somebody would buy it, hopefully they would read it, but I had no visibility with those people. Nowadays, I have direct contact with my readers every day. Emails, Twitter, Facebook, I'm just constantly in contact with them. This allows new business models to be built up. And I think one of the solutions is in the future, musicians need to cultivate direct relationships with their audience. And they can work out the terms themselves. Give it away, you give me some money, you know, or you know, I have, you know, some people are doing these things, hey, I'm gonna put the names of a thousand people on my next album. And if you get a certain amount, you get a free album, but your name is out there. I support all these things. And I think fundamentally we can't rely on the entertainment companies anymore to help us. Because they don't have a clue. I hate to say this, the people running the major entertainment companies do not have a clue. They have created the crisis, and a solution is for us to bypass them and deal directly with the end audience. Any other questions? A microphone's coming here. Yeah, we'll give you, he's going to give you a mic. Hi. Um, would you say that um, the main uh, thesis behind a lot of your thinking is more that you want people to care more about art or that you want artists to be paid more? I think they go hand in hand. What I think is incorrect thinking is there's a view that's prevalent in the entertainment industry that if you make it too smart, too artistic, too sophisticated, with too much musical talent, that the audience doesn't want that. 
So the message I've been trying to convey again and again whenever I get a platform is that is incorrect thinking. That people do care about art if you give them access to it. And the musician will make more money eventually by embracing that. I just wrote an article, you should check it out, it's called The Rise of Artists in Music, where I look at 10, 15 examples in the last year of pop stars that have embraced more traditional metrics, metrics of musical talent. And so even the pop stars are real. Why is Lady Gaga touring with Tony Bennett? Why is Miss Lauren Hill singing Nina Simone songs? Why is Queen Latifah doing Bessie Smith songs? Why did Kendrick Lamar hire jazz musicians for his album? Why did D'Angelo hire Roy Hargrove, a jazz trumpeter, for his album? What you're seeing again and again is the pop stars themselves realize, I need some musical talent here. So I think it goes hand in hand. People should care about art. People want the artistic experience. And the musician will make more money if they stand up for their convictions. And tell the entertainment companies, you're wrong on this. Because they are wrong on this. They're going to kill everything if we let them to continue to go on the path they're going. Good question. We've got time for two more questions. So at the very end, you talked a little bit about how Star Wars being serial, more, just more of the same thing, but you also talked about HBO, which people have criticized in the past for every episode sort of falling in to some of the same formulaic HBO type things, once again, going towards adults, um, boobs, uh, things of that kind, like there has to be a certain number for every episode. Um, how, how do you make that difference, and how does that relate back to music. I, I actually, I agree with exactly what you say. Even HBO has these formulaic things they do. But they tend to be 5%. You watch an HBO show, there's always the scene where people take off their, their clothes and shout out the F word. I mean, this, HBO says, so we need this for the, you know. They do, they do. But it's generally just one scene. What I'm saying is, is if you look at HBO, like you look at things like The Sopranos, or True Detective, or uh, you just look at all these HBO, or all these, 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 these um, cable premium view shows, they're very sophisticated. Doesn't mean that they don't have formulas too, but it tends to be a smaller part. And even their shows would be better if they would, they would move beyond that and just, okay, we'll have people take off their clothes and shout the F word when it's important to the plot. You know, that would, that would, that would be an amazing leap forward. But no, I, I agree with what you're saying there. Let's do one more question. Who else? There we go. Someone over there. Okay, so earlier you were talking about HBO, Netflix, and Spotify, um, which Spotify is still a fairly new company, but like HBO has been around for 40 years, Netflix has been around for 20 years, and Spotify, I didn't discover it until four years ago, but it's been around for coming up on 10, um, given more time, do you think Spotify has the chance to be a company like Netflix or HBO where it can develop and actually pay artists? And also, you got to consider it doesn't have the opportunity of quality control. Yeah. So. Spotify could evolve into a great company and also a great company for musicians. You know, not long ago, I was... I wrote an article called The 25 Things I Hate About Streaming. And it's a, it's a long list of things I hate about streaming. And I got a phone call from somebody who ran a streaming site. He said, I want to meet you. I actually want to do some of the things. You know, one of the things I said is, you said every song, there should be a little thing place you could click to give money directly to the artist. Like a tip for the musician, you know? I call this free trade music, you know? And, and we, we had all these ideas and he was going to put them into play, but he couldn't get funding, and so the thing never, it never amounted to anything. But I could see if, if the people running Spotify were understood the creative side and the artistic side and what it takes to nurture a musical ecosystem, they could create a wonderful company that would be beneficial to, to all parties. But I'm not holding my breath, because the, the, what you find is the people at these, it's a tech company. Spotify is a tech company. It's run out of Europe. They don't, they don't have an appreciation of what music's all about. So they would need to hire other people. It could happen. Let's hope it does happen. Absolutely, let's hope it does happen. 
Thank you very much. I appreciate it. If anyone has more questions, come down. I'll be here. Thank you.